Welcome to the American Antiquarian Society. We join you today from the ancestral lands of the Nipmuc tribal community who remain a very vibrant presence here in central Massachusetts. I'm Scott Casper, president of the American Antiquarian Society, and we're delighted to have you with us today for our conference, Textual Editing and the Future of Scholarly Editions, a conference on the bicentennial of James Fenimore Cooper's The Spy hosted by the American Antiquarian Society with the generous support of the Cooper edition and the Bibliographic Society of America. Since some of you may not be familiar with the American Antiquarian Society, I'd like to say a few words about AAS. The American Antiquarian Society is a research library of American history and culture from earliest European colonization up to about the year 1900. We're also a learned society founded here in Worcester, Massachusetts in 1812 by the printer Isaiah Thomas. In 2013, the American Antiquarian Society received the National Humanities Medal. Our mission is to collect, preserve, and share America's and Americans' diverse stories. We do that by making accessible our broad and unparalleled collections of books, pamphlets, newspapers and serials, graphic arts and manuscripts to researchers in all fields, as well as creative artists. The American Antiquarian Society awards approximately 50 fellowships per year. Uh, several of these are long-term National Endowment for the Humanities Fellowships. Many of the others for research scholars and creative artists are funded by philanthropic gifts to the society. We hold and host public and scholarly programs. Traditionally, we've held them in Antiquarian Hall uh, in the building that you can see on my screen here. Uh, we have, of course, over the last year, been holding our programs virtually, and we anticipate continuing to do that even after the pandemic. We're delighted that so many of you have been able to join us here today from all over the country and indeed all over the world, and we want to continue doing that into the future. I also encourage you to visit and to bookmark AmericanAntiquarian.org where you can keep abreast of our continuing slate of programs, both public and scholarly, as well as following our email annou announcements and social media. Beyond its fellowships and scholarly programs, the American Antiquarian Society has been engaged in significant collaborative scholarly projects over many decades always based in our collections. Since the 1980s, for example, AAS has been the hub for the study of American book history, the study of authorship, reading, and publishing in America. We organized and published the five volume History of the Book in America series from the 1990s to 2010. For even longer, since the 1960s, the American Antiquarian Society has been a sponsor of the Cooper edition, a scholarly edition of the works of James Fenimore Cooper with the seal of the Committee on Scholarly Editions of the Modern Language Association. To support the Cooper edition, AAS has long and actively collected editions of Cooper's works printed in any language up to the year 1877. This is the result of a commitment by AAS President Marcus McCorrison in the late 1960s. It's also the work, the ongoing work of our curators and librarians ever since. This collection includes also key manuscript materials related to Cooper's authorship and the publication of his works, a portion of Cooper's personal papers, the personal library and publication uh, uh, and papers of Cooper edition editor, James Beard, and much more. Researchers have for many years come to AAS to work in the Cooper materials, notably Alan Taylor for his Pulitzer Prize winning book, William Cooper's Town, and Wayne Franklin for his comprehensive biography of James Fenimore Cooper. Please check out on our website, the virtual exhibition, James Fenimore Cooper, Shadow and Substance, where you can view many of these collection materials. This conference today and tomorrow coincides with the 200th anniversary of the publication of Cooper's first major novel, The Spy. But as you can tell from the announcement and the program, and as you'll see very shortly, 
our program is about much more than Cooper, and it looks forward as much as it looks backward. Several years ago, Lance Schachterly of the Worcester Polytechnic Institute, who is an AAS member and the editor-in-chief of the Cooper edition, approached then AAS president Ellen Dunlap to let her know that the bicentennial of the spy was coming up in 2021. And I want here to give special credit to Lance and the, and the Cooper edition for their generous support for this conference from beginning to end, including financial support to make it possible for all of us to be here uh, for free. Uh, AAS staff and an advisory committee, including Lance Schachterly and also Jay Elliott of Clark University and Wayne Franklin, discussed how to celebrate this moment, considering the society's long involvement with the Cooper edition. Many ideas were broached, including a variety of public programs, as well as a scholarly conference. The pandemic, of course, changed our plans, and we decided to focus on this conference. Guided by a roster of outstanding scholars on four panels, two panels today and two more tomorrow, we will think together about the role of the scholarly edition in research today the ways that libraries can help with pr those producing scholarly editions, both in print and digital, and how textual editing plays a role in English departments today. We'd like to thank a number of people for contributing to organizing this conference. I've mentioned Lance Schachterly, whose contributions and leadership have been outstanding, as well as Jay Elliott, Wayne Franklin, James David Moran, who is Vice President for Programs and Outreach here at AAS. I want to thank especially Ashley Cataldo, who is Curator of Manuscripts at AAS, and she has done both the intellectual and the logistical work to envision this conference, its focus, and to engage an exceptional group of speakers for keynote talks and panels Ashley has attended to every conference of making, every aspect of making this conference happen, and it would not have happened without her. Thank you so much, Ashley. Thank you also to Kevin Wisniewski, whom I'm going to introduce in just a moment. He's director of book history and digital initiatives because he is lending his technical and logistical support today and tomorrow. We're grateful in addition to Lance and the Cooper edition to the Bibliographical Society of America for support for the conference. And we are also grateful to G. Thomas Tansell for providing a written statement about his reflections on the Cooper edition and textual editing. That statement is available on the AAS website. Before I introduce our first keynote speaker, I'm going to turn it over briefly to Kevin Wisniewski, who will tell us a bit about the technical side, how you can how you can respond in the chat room and so on. Kevin? Great. Thank you very much, Scott, uh, and welcome, everybody. Um, we are currently hosting uh, this in a Zoom webinar, and there are two functions that I'd like to highlight for you. Uh, first, at the bottom of the menu bar, you will see the chat function. Um, this is where I will be sharing helpful links uh, throughout the panelists' uh, talks today, um, including uh, links to upcoming AAS virtual programs. Uh, you are welcome to use that for chit chat individually between, uh, 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 between you or, or for the entire group to, uh, to enjoy. Uh, second, uh, you'll see that there is a Q&A function. Uh, as questions arise during the panel, I recommend that you submit questions there instead of waiting to the very end. Uh, following uh, the talk, uh, these questions will be shared with our panelists and we'll try to get to as many as time allows. Uh, there's also a feature in uh, the Q&A uh, function where you can uh, upvote particular questions. Uh, finally, I would like to let everyone know that this program is being recorded uh, for those who cannot attend, uh, the video will be made available on the AAS YouTube channel. So thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the next two days. And Scott, back to you. Thanks so much, Kevin. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the first of our four sessions entitled The Past, Present, and Future of the Scholarly Edition. This session features a keynote presentation from Amy Earhart, whom I'll introduce in a moment, and papers from panelists Douglas Jones, Joycelyn Moody, and Kirsten Silva-Gruce. 
I regret to note that Derek Spires, who was slated to give one of the keynote presentations, is not able to speak today due to a family medical situation that requires his time and attention, though he's hoping to tune in by phone if he's able. And now to introduce our first keynote speaker. Amy Earhart is Associate Professor of English and Affiliated Faculty of Africana Studies at Texas A&M University. A 2020 Texas A&M University Presidential Impact Fellow and a 2019 Texas A&M Arts and Humanities Fellow, Dr. Earhart has participated in grants and fellowships received from the NEH, the ACLS, and the Mellon Foundation. In 2020, she received an NEH Mellon Fellowship for digital publication for her book length project, Digital Humanities and the Infrastructures of Race in African American Literature. She's also won numerous teaching awards, including the University Distinguished Achievement Award from the Association of Former Students and Texas A&M University. Earhart's scholarship has focused on examining infrastructures of technology and their impact and replication of race, building infrastructure for digital humanities work and embedding humanities projects within the classroom, as well as tracing the history and futures of digital humanities with a particular interest in the ways digital humanities and critical race studies intersect. Her digital products are constructed to expand access to black humanities materials, as is the case with projects such as the Millican Massacre 1868, DIB, the Digital Black Bibliographic Project, and Alex Haley's Malcolm X, the Malcolm X I Knew, and note cards from the autobiography of Malcolm X, which is a collaborative project with undergraduate and graduate students published in scholarly editing. Earhart has published scholarship on a variety of digital humanities topics with work that includes a monograph, traces of old, uses of the new, the emergence of digital literary studies, a co-edited collection called The American Literature Scholar in the Digital Age, and a number of articles and book chapters. Her current projects include a book length manuscript called Can a Computer Be Racist? Digital Humanities and the Infrastructures of Race in African-American Literature, a related digital project, Infrastructures of Race, and she's editing the Civil War writings for the collected works of Harriet Beecher Stowe, forthcoming from Oxford University Press. So it's a pleasure to welcome Amy Earhart here virtually to AAS and to this conference. Amy? Thank you ever so much, Scott. I'm going to go ahead and um, get my screen sharing going. And I want to I want to thank you all. I long ago worked at AAS as a graduate student, and I can just remember some of those aha moments when I was looking through broadsides and the like. Um, and it's thank you again for inviting me to speak with you all today. Um, I am saddened that Derek Spires won't be joining us. Um, I'm a huge fan of his work. Every time I hear him present, when I read his material. Um, I always learn something really important, so, so he is definitely missed today. I was asked to talk about the past, present, and futures of scholarly editing um, with the perspective of the current co-chair of the MLA Committee on Scholarly Editing, and to introduce three scholars conducting important editorial work. I come to textual editing like many of my generation. I'm a bridge scholar between the print world of editing and the digital. My training was, unlike many who were in graduate school in the 90s, inflected with scholarly editing and bibliography, in large part due to my work with James Harner, who is a dearly missed mentor. Um, and, you know, I, I remember James sort of schooling me on uh, appropriate understandings of scholarly editing. So I, I, can, I, can, uh, I can really thank him for, for what I know. I was also trained in African-American literature at a moment when there was an explosion of recovered black texts. In 1995, I was on a CLA panel giving a paper on Harriet Wilson with Dr. Frances Smith Foster. First terrifying because I think she is one of the most important editors and scholars of her generation, but also because Frances Smith Foster um, during the panel, she talked about discovering documentation, situating Wilson in New Hampshire and adding to what we knew at the time about Wilson's life. I still remember her turning to me at the end of the panel and saying, you keep going, you're headed in the right direction. 
And I still think about that. What I learned from reading Dr. Smith Foster's scholarship among that of other important black literary scholars is that a long tradition of black recovery and editing among other fields of recovery and editing doesn't get its due within conversations regarding scholarly editing. And at the same time, we have so much more to do, more editing of black texts, women's texts, texts by writers of colors, indigenous text and materials, queer writers text, text not in, Eng in English and so on. And some of this is because of the infrastructures that have been built around scholarly editing have ignored or denigrated the work of scholars editing in these fields. I am pleased that this conference has brought a historically strong scholarly edition, the writings of James Fenimore Cooper into discussion with scholars who are working in many different ways to edit the text that we see as central to our scholarship. I wanna congratulate all of those involved with the writings of James Fenimore Cooper. The beginnings of the Cooper writings correspond with the story of the MLA Committee on Scholarly Editing. The partnership with an archival institution like the AAS that has a strong commitment to collecting work by a particular author, and then a focus on producing a multi-volume edition of a well-known canonical author are traditional ways of developing scholarly editions. A look through the CSE seal and editions confirms this. Much of the effort in both print edition building and the awarding of seals have focused on a fairly specific canonical group of authors. While the CSE has a charge to continue to support such excellent and long-standing editions like the Cooper, we're also working to shift the narrow focus of past committees to work toward inclusion of a broader set of authors that are more reflective of the contemporary study of literature, including broadening beyond canonical figures, acknowledging the fine works occurring within digital edition building, and encouraging one-off or smaller edition submissions. Currently, we're working with expansion in digital editions, as well as in expanding the editions to which we're awarding seals. When the Blake edition was awarded the CSE seal in 2005, it was a shift forward for the CSE acknowledging the work underway in the intersections of digital humanities and editing. However, we still haven't awarded many seals to digital editions. So far we have Twain, Alfric, and one other digital edition currently under review. Part of the issue with um, awarding the digital editions of the seal is outreach, where we must make more of an effort to encourage the projects to apply. So for example, we don't have um, a seal that we've given to the Whitman or the Cather archives, which you know seems ludicrous to me. But the other half is the way that our evaluation criteria make clear that only very narrow forms of digital work are appropriate for seal approval. In the 2016 MLA statement on scholarly edition in the digital age, the report notes, at its inception and in its early documents, the committee on scholarly editions adopted a fairly specific definition of the kinds of editions it would cultivate and endorse. More recent CSE discussions have emphasized the need to broaden the scope of the CSE's attention to include different editorial modalities, highlighting the need for a set of standards of excellence that can generalize well across different types of editions. Our current committee is now charged with putting these statements, this statement into action, and our focus has begun with the reviewer guidelines. Um, and here's uh, the section of the reviewer guidelines that deal with <laughs> electronic editions. And you can see how fairly um, out of date e these, um, these uh, guidelines are. And, and it's high time um, that we really focus on this and think about how we are fully integrating digital editing projects into the CSE sealed awarding. Um, and we have the charge from the 2016 report. I think at the same time, we're concerned with a false equivalency of print to digital. Surely we might make space for innovations such as micro editions that might also gain the seal. Or we might understand that some paratextual materials in the digital form look different than that of the paratextual materials in the print form. Not every edition need look like a print edition as was modeled in early DH textual studies work. They're exciting new projects 
underway that are fully committed to editing that may not follow the previous models developed over a long period of book technologies, but instead develop new models of editing within digital format. We also need to consider the publishing market where few multi-volume scholarly editions are currently being, you know, they're not, not being um, approved by the publishers and certainly gone are the days of robust financial support for individual author productions. With shifts in publishing, we might recognize that without commitment to a broad understanding of editions, we might develop an even more narrow idea of editing as only very lucrative popular authors will be deemed appropriate for support by the market. And let's make clear, digital editions are not free. They are not cheap. As Kenneth Price reminds us, even open access editions have high costs associated with them. These are all questions for the future of scholarly editing and central to the infrastructures that support such work. We're at a moment where we need to think about the ways that scholarly infrastructures, financial, prestige, publication, et cetera, need to change to support the editing that moves beyond a narrow set of text and authors. The CSE has expanded our seal awardees beyond American authors initially included in, this, in the original CEAA list. At the same time, we have been lax in awarding seals to women writers, non-English language texts, and writers of color. Um, and I should point out that Frederick Douglass is the only black writer whose edition has been awarded a seal. Today, we are fortunate enough to hear from panelists whose work exemplifies the best of scholarly editing. Douglas Jones is the editor of Mariah W. Stewart, Essential Writings of a Black Feminist Abolitionist and Political Philosopher, forthcoming in Oxford UP 2022. Joycelyn Moody is the editor of Memoirs of Eleanor Elridge, West Virginia UP 2014. And Kirsten Silvergruss is editing a Spanish language novel serially published in New Orleans, A Marriage Like Many Other. I have two editing projects underway as well, an experimental digital edition of Jean Toomer's Kane and the two volume Civil War writings of Harriet Beecher Stowe for the collected works of Harriet Beecher Stowe. I look forward to hearing the presentations by each panelist as I think their work works are exemplars of the best of what is currently happening in scholarly editing. At the same time, we still have much to do. In a recent chapter in the Debates in Digital Humanities, Digital Black Atlantic volume, I call for a renaissance in Black digital ed editing. Such a renaissance is necessary across numerous fields, including the one in which I work. I am concerned that many of the primary texts that scholars of Black literature have been using have never been properly edited, leaving huge gaps in our understanding of textual transmission. The lack of attention has resulted in poorly edited, at times largely inaccurate primary texts. For example, our only existing print edition of The New Negro has actually dropped various illustrations which impact the way we understand the text. As George Bornstein shows, the currently available text appears to be a facsimile version, yet various book decorations and portraits by Wine, Wine Old Reese have been removed, as well as Reese's name on the title page. In addition, the subtitle of the book, An Interpretation, has likewise been excised. Bornstein rightfully notes that the removal of Reese's images has only contributed to the representation of the Harlem Renaissance as a Black-only Renaissance ignoring the complicated and often problematic participation of whites that work by scholars that work by scholars have begun to reclaim. I think of George Hutchinson's work here. David Walker's appeal is a prime example of a central text in African-American literature and history that has received little editorial attention. Um, the works that have been produced have mainly been produced for historical um, purposes, not literary purposes. And I think there's a real difference in the way we think about textual editing. Um, David Walker's appeal went through various printings and three editions. Should we collect the various extant printings owned by just a few libraries and compare them, it is possible that we might find differences in the printing that reveal new findings about Walker's text. However, our current editions of the, uh, the appeal focus on one reprinted text rather than an edition which considers multiple editions and printings. A survey of articles that cite Walker reveal that the majority of literary scholars are using the 1965 Hill and Wang 
Charles M. Wilty edited reprint of the third edition of Walker's text for analysis, a problematic edition due to errors and the lack of attention to other editions and printings. In 2000, Peter Hinks issued a new, walk, a new edition of Walker's Appeal on Penn State Press. The Hinks edition is far more thorough in its editorial introduction, but it still doesn't include apparatus that shows collation and the analysis of various printings. So neither the 1965 nor 2000 editions are the scholarly editions that I think we need to understand this crucial text. Now, Leon Jackson has begun this project and it appears from his social media posts that there will be new findings regarding the appeal that will impact how we understand the text and its transmission. And it's high time that serious editorial edition be given to Walker. Primary texts such as those by Zora Neale Hurston have not been edited using available manuscripts, such as Hurston's 1933 Jonas Gordvine manuscript housed in the Schomburg, nor the multiple printings, such as the 1938 Italian translation of Their Eyes Were Watching God by Ada Prospero or Pospero Torino, and her name is, um, shows up in, in different ways. There's an intriguing 2018 article in Palimpsest by Rita Filanti that examines the translation of their eyes. Filanti notes that Prospero was a strenuous anti-fascist militant, women's, right, women's rights activist, and prolific translator from English, French, and Russian. Filanti discusses in detail the choices Prospero made in translating Hurston's text, including her choices in the way that she translated the dialect. Filanti writes, Prospero believes that if black vernacular has to broaden the range of dialect in literature, which she is positive it will, its translation must divorce it from the conventions of the burlesque. Thus she creates a plain Italian that is grammatical without being ornate, neither elaborate nor regionally inflected, she includes lexical variety and invention without being verbose. At a moment when we are interested in transnationalism, surely attention to translations of central texts is needed. These examples are some of the many found across not only my field, but other fields as well. I wanna suggest a multi-pronged approach to resolving this problem. We obviously need more attention to scholarly editing of a broad range of texts from a variety of traditions, of course. But I wanna emphasize that there is a long history of exemplary scholarly editing that is not represented in the infrastructure, say, of the CSE. Much of this long history of work has been ignored, um, as is apparent if you look through the CSE seal list of editions. In fact, each of the panelists are producing such exemplary and needed scholarly additions. The CSE has been discussing how best to proceed to address this exclusion apparent in the CSE sale list. And again, we face a systemic issue built into the infrastructures of scholarly editing. For example, the CSE guidelines are limited, which has led to the exclusion of certain types of editions. We also have a commitment to long-standing multi-edition projects such as the Cooper. Such a commitment actually butts against our limited resources um, with funding to only move a few editions through the review process each year. Hence, we might be asked to review several volumes per year from longstanding editions, using up the funding and leaving little room for new commission, commitments to editions that would expand the CSE list. It's a real problem. We wanna to continue to um, review and support longstanding projects like the Cooper, but then there's so little room to bring in new additions, which is central to the committee's charge. And we're not quite sure how to resolve this. Um, we have been discussing, in fact, I had a flurry of emails this morning about this very issue. We've been discussing how to address the systemic issue. We've also been talking about how we honor the exemplary micro editions that are being produced, particularly digital micro editions. Um, we wanna expand our conception of editions to think about the complexities of editing materials that are not textual, such as is the case with projects like Tisha, listening to the work of indigenous scholars who have called us to think about different traditions of knowledge productions. Here, I want to credit um, dearly Miss Tim Powell, who contributed a foundational essay to the American Literature in the Digital Age collection um, that I edited long ago. 
um, Tim really helped me to think through the way that editing might occur differently due to different knowledge systems. I also want to credit Kim Christian, whose Mukadu CMS is a reminder of the ways that different knowledge systems function and the ethics of editing and transmission. As we move forward into a period when print and digital edition are flourishing, I encourage the AAS and other libraries to think broadly about how to support editing. While we still will have multi-volume print editions, the limitations of the publishing market means that there will be more micro editions, such as those supported through the Hub, a recently funded project, uh, PI Jessica to Spain, or the Black Book Interactive Project, Mary Emma Graham's project that stems the digital project that comes out of her longstanding history of Black writing, which has done amazing work supporting um, work by scholars who, who want to use sort of digital micro edition production. We'll have experimental editing and other editing that might not look like what came before, but with attention to the infrastructures that support such work, such as the CSE seal, I hope that we will continue to see the exemplary editing that is represented by projects in this conference. Again, congratulations are due to the writings of James Fenimore Cooper, to the team and to the AAS. And I look forward to what comes next. Thank you. And now I believe I am, uh, Scott, do you mind if I go ahead and introduce the next person? I believe, okay. Um, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Joycelyn Moody. Um, Joycelyn Moody teaches and researches African-American literature, Black life writing, and Black feminisms as the Sue E. Denman Distinguished Chair in, African, in American Literature and Professor of English at the University of Texas at San Antonio. She is series editor of African-American Literature in Transition, currently published by Cambridge UP, and with John Ernst. Ernest, she is series co-editor of Regenerations, African-American Literature and Culture, published since 2009 by West Virginia UP. Her edited collection, A History of African-American Autobiography, will appear from Cambridge next month. Very exciting. Joycelyn? Thank you, Amy, and thank you, everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to have been um, honored to have been invited to present today. Um, so the title of my remarks, um, I'm going to keep to an original title, but you'll see that I diverged from it um, at one point. Uh, also, allow me to begin with a bit of an apology in that, um, you know, uh, I was reading something in the New York Times recently about um, sounds, how sounds affect individuals differently. And um, one of the, you know, in that we all have, you know, a particular sound that grates on our nerves. And mine is mowing the lawn. And of course, my neighbors pick this moment to mow their lawns. And so <laughs> I'm very distracted by the sound that most aggravates me. Um, so uh, I offer that as an explanation for any, um, any distractedness on my part. So my original title, again, that I'm somewhat diverging from is why John Ernest and I created Regenerations and what we have learned along the way. I was preparing my preparation, I was finishing my preparation of these remarks when Davis Spires had a family emergency arise and Amy Earhart agreed to replace him. Dr. Earhart kindly contacted the members of this panel and in the process of greeting us mentioned her chapter in the new book, The Digital Black Atlantic, just out from the University of Minnesota Press. Earhart's chapter is entitled An Editorial Turn, Reviving Print and Digital Editing of Black Authored Literary Text. And its astute provocations changed the direction of my remarks this morning. I'll return to Earhart's chapter in a moment, but allow me to begin with a few observations and details about regenerations. I was privileged to be tagged by John as co-conspirator for Regenerations. He approached me sometime in 2009 while he was still a professor at, the, at West Virginia University. And by 2010, the first text, Hearts of Gold, had appeared beautifully bound and expertly edited by John Ernest and Eric Gardner. Um, let's see, I think we're, I think you might be seeing their website. Um, at any rate, uh, 
here is John's book. Let me see if I can see what you're seeing. Yeah, so um, I hope that you're seeing the cover of John and Eric's book, actually, Eric Gardner. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, so um, I think they may have put the link in the, in the chat. Um, Amy, we were going to have uh, the website going um, at this point, please, or Kevin. Thank you. Um, at any rate, if you go to the University of West Virginia Press's website, you'll see um, a link to Regenerations, and, uh, and there you can see the covers of the book. So our first text was published in 2010, Hearts of Gold, beautifully bound and expertly edited by John Ernest and Eric Gardner. To date, Regenerations has reprinted and has in its queue texts that add to the canon of African-American, which is to say American texts representing antebellum slave narratives, postbellum slave narratives, civil war familial discourses, serialized and bound novels published at the turn into the 21st century, some after the war. Thank you. Transatlantic ministerial life writing, transcontinental spiritual life, uh, narrative, uh, mid, mid 20th century migration narratives, an early 19th century Northern Black woman's biography, or cast as memoir. Um, black life writing revised for children is in the queue, as well as late Black women's 19th century diaries and other private writings. So we have a number of things that um, we have published, uh, as well as many in the queue. There are other ways of articulating the contributions and interventions Regeneration strives to make into American and African-American cultural studies, but I trust this list of genres intimates some of those further possible articulations. Each of the texts that we've published responds to our 2010, our original then mission statement, which is Regenerations is a new series devoted to reprinting editions of important African-American texts that have fallen out of print or have failed to receive attention they merit. Regenerations encourages research that develops and extends the understanding of African-American literary and cultural history by promoting regional and local research that represents the complex dynamics of the African-American experience. And I would say now experiences. Initial calls for the proposal included this assertion. Each book in the series will benefit from collaborations between experienced and emerging scholars and will feature strong biographical and historical introductions, full annotations when appropriate, and when possible, an appendix with relevant materials by or about the author. Finally, those, there's more I could say, we encouraged attention to transnationality by inviting proposals focused on New Southern Studies, African-American Resettlements in Canada, Studies of the Black West, and works exploring the American Midwest, um, as well as the Caribbean and Latin America. And those are in no particular order. So John and I started Regenerations in 2009 with West Virginia University Press. Our current representative on the board is the director of the press, Derek Krisoff. It's been lovely working with him and his team at, w at um, WVUP. John and I are expected to, and we do, provide due diligence in our oversight of each manuscript to the press. Our endorsement of a proposed reprint goes a long way with the press director. In addition, we send manuscripts to external readers, not for contingent approval, but to provide advice and comments that enable us to ensure a consistently high quality series. So it's a very collaborative approach. The reports from these readers have been generally well received by submitting scholars, thanks to the sensitivity and generosity of our readers. Through Jury Regenerations, John and I have begun to recenter by reprinting African-American texts from, from the 1700s through approximately 1941. He and I are both fascinated by black print culture and committed to conducting research investigating black print culture. I don't know about John, but I don't think of myself as a scholar of textual studies. So feeling a little bit of an interloper on this panel. Um, still, as an editor, I believe Regenerations has accomplished a few things, including 
we've made reprints available to contemporary readers with scholarly introductions and some very illuminating scholarly editing. We've made new text available for teaching with contextualizing appendices. And that's been a big part of our mission as well, though more tacit than explicit. Broad knowledge of, we've um, advanced knowledge of African-American literature, especially from the 19th century US beyond texts that, are, that already circulate pretty widely. We've increased texts in the US black literature canons um, and reminded readers that there are more texts that we um, can know and that we have yet to know. What have we learned as editors of the series, politics of recovering texts like the uh, memoirs of Eleanor Eldridge, which I myself prepared for the series. Um, and that raises the question uh, that we've encountered in some other uh, contributions proposals that we face the question of what is black literature and how do we discuss the parameters of black authorship, particularly in that case, because the memoir of El memoirs of Eleanor Eldridge were um, edited, were prepared, authored by a woman named Frances Whipple, maybe known to some of you as Frances Whipple Green. Um, and I don't think that was her last surname, I can't remember. Uh, we learned also that editions take a long time and most in our series have taken many years from proposal idea to um, a bound text. So we have more in the queue than we have actually published thus far. Additions require steady communication between volume editors and the series editors, John and me. Um, especially at the copy editing stage, we have paid serious attention to checking archival manuscript versions against original versions of the text that we're printing. We're firm about insisting that volume editors painstakingly check their manuscripts or other editions make a manuscript against an original. Um, version of the text that we're reprinting. So th um, that's very difficult work and requires um, very sincere collaboration and steady, communi uh, steady communication. While not every reprint in Regenerations has a note on the text, um, where there have been any changes at all to the original publication, we have ensured scholars document and comment on those changes. So, um, so that's some things about what John and I have, um, have been doing in Regenerations. I want to add one other thing, um, bearing in mind Amy's chapter, Earhart's chapter in the digital um, Black Atlantic. Um, and that, as I said, was just brought to my attention. And I've read it over the past couple of days with great fascination. And I highly recommend it. Um, I look forward to reading the rest of the book, as a matter of fact. Earhart's chapter reminds me to add that one thing that's particularly important to John and me, and that's a measure of quality control, if I may say it that way. We are committed to a series that reads Black literature according to critical race theory and Black feminist theory or other theoretical frameworks that name Black authority and power, as well as naming Black white supremacy and white fragility. Of course, I'm using the phrase from D'Angelo. So those are important, and I think they're implicit in our mission statement. Um, and uh, if not, then those who submit pro proposals to us are quickly um, informed that critical race theory and Black feminist theories are the primary ways of reading Black literature that we, um, that we uh, espouse and ascribe to. Um, so race and racial identity are foregrounded as in the mission statement. Um, at this point, um, let's see, I don't know how long I've been talking. How am I doing on time, please? Okay, all right. So, okay, thank you. Um, so I wanna mention that at the same time that I began preparing my remarks, I was finishing um, a reading. So of the last few days, last week or so, um, I was finishing uh, Angela Davis's um, Freedom is a Constant Struggle. I wanna mention that I was reading my print copy at the same time that I was listening to it. Um, here it is, it's such a, um, an amazing book. It's turned out to be one of the most transformative reading experiences I've had in a long time. Um, and I listened to it on Audible where Angela Davis is reading her speeches and the interviews are um, 
read by uh, Davis and another. So you get the um, intensity of her responses to questions and interviews. So it's a fabulous book, although it's tiny. Um, I'll be teaching it in the fall. That's one of the reasons why I began to explore it. Um, so I, when I talk about Black feminist theory, I use it in the same way that Angela Davis does. And I'm going to read a couple of quotes from Davis's uh, from Davis's articulation of black, feminist, um, black feminism, not necessarily black feminist theory. She reminds us in Freedom is a Constant Struggle that black feminism emerged as a theoretical and practical effort, demonstrating that race, gender, and class are inseparable in the social worlds in which we inhabit. And I mentioned this partly, I'm gonna continue in a moment, um, but I mentioned this partly because textual editing and the kinds of work that John and I do when I stress the collaboration and the communication that are involved, I speak to the um, social, what Davis is calling the social worlds in which we inhabit. In other words, our um, series is definitely a social endeavor as much as it is a scholarly endeavor. Um, Davis also adds this uh, about black feminisms that I wanna share. She says, I often like to talk about feminism, not as something that adheres to bodies, not as something grounded in gender bodies, but rather as an approach, as a way of conceptualizing, as a methodology, as a guide to keep, as a guide to strategies for struggle. And it's the guide for strategies, to strategies for struggle that inheres in regenerations. And that is crucial to Earhart's um, chapter in the Black Digital, um, in the Black Digital uh, Atlantic. Um, okay, so um, in Davis's, I want to proceed, con uh, proceed by referring to um, quoting Davis's, another of Davis's speech, this was given in South Africa in 2013. So throughout the, her book, throughout her speeches, she refers regularly to the 1960s Black Panther Party's 10 point plan. And she writes this about, in, at Burbank University, she um, enumerates them where she generally just refers her audiences to, um, to Google. She says, go Google it and you'll find X, Y, and Z. And then she summarizes. But at Burbeck, she, Birkbeck, she decided to read each one of them and elaborate on them. So she reads this one that I think is so pertinent here. And again, to Earhart's, to the, um, to the uh, um, primary takeaway for me of Earhart's chapter. This is Davis, uh, um, are quoting from the Black Panther Party's 10 point plan. And finally, number 10, we want land, bread, housing, education, clothing, justice, peace, and people's control, people's community control of modern technology. And she adds this very interesting phrase, uh, this very interesting passage. What is so interesting about this manifesto, this, um, and she means the 10 point plan, is that it recapitulates 19th century abolitionist agendas. And of course, the most advanced abolitionists in the 19th century recognized that slavery could not be ended simply by abolishing slavery, but rather that institutions had to be produced that would incorporate former slaves into a new and developing democracy. Okay, so I wanted to mention that um, I, th I find that incredibly profound and pertinent to the work of scholarly series like the one that John and I have, um, have been trying to build, have been building. Uh, not that we're recapitulating uh, re 19th century, ab um, of the abolition agendas, but that we believe that education is key. So we're in sync with the Black Panther Party. I don't know what John would say about this, by the way, I haven't run these ideas by him and I perhaps he's in our audience today, but that insta rather that institutions had to be produced that would incorporate former slaves into a new and developing democracy. So what is it that I find so provocative about 
um, Amy's, uh, Amy Earhart's um, chapter? Well, several things. Uh, one is her concentration on competing versions of text in Black um, literary studies uh, and historical studies. So you'll find in her chapter uh, a discussion of the Arnold series from the 1960s and 70s, um, as a matter of fact. At, at this point, I think, um, I've uh, Amy, could you please drop into the chat now the two versions of the Kambahi River uh, Collective? Sure. Oh, thank you. So the Kambahi, um, so I used to teach uh, a um, the Kambahi River Collective in an early edition from the 1980s in print. So when um, Black feminisms and when feminisms by women of color were um, were uh, began to be proliferated. I'm thinking of texts like The Black Woman by uh, Tony K. Bambara and also um, In Conditions Five and This Bridge Called My Back by uh, Ansel Duan Moraga and so on. So where it was first published. And, and then I began to just lift it from the web. So, and Amy calls this um, very bad scholarship and teaching. So I lifted this from the web and you'll see the one I think that's named. Um, so there should be two and uh, so the one, and then there we go. And then, so that's the 19, um, 79, the one that's labeled Kambahi 1979. And then I have the original Kambahi River uh, Collective Statement, which if we open, we see it's actually not the original because a, um, a pretext from, um, here we go, from uh, Barbara Smith uh, says that um, it's been published elsewhere. What's fascinating though, is that the one on the web is simply a typed copy and has uh, makes doesn't have the layout from off our backs, which is just so powerful, just as a graphic itself, the text as a graphic. And then of course, the one on the web lifted from the web doesn't include these photographs. So in my teaching, I began to, uh, I've always taught pure text, but I began to focus on the differences between those and the importance of the paratext, which is central to um, the kind of work that John and I are doing, but also in, um, in Amy's paper. So um, uh, uh, Erhard raises the question of whether um, this is a, a tech, this is my interpretation of uh, one of her findings, raises the question is, is no text um, by a black person better than, is a bad text, um, uh, is a no text better than a bad text? Um, are we miseducating? When was I miseducating when I taught um, the uh, web version as opposed to the off our backs version of the Kambahi River Collective? Oh, I also wanted to mention, and assuming that I still have more time, I also wanted to um, show you these now. They've um, blown away from me. There, there are two editions of, uh, here they are. Two editions of um, Beyond Katrina, a book that I absolutely love to teach. So um, these are there are two editions here, both of them published in 2010. So imagine my surprise when I was using this as my primary teaching text, and my students would say, but we couldn't find it. And I said, well, I ordered for you the 2010 version. Well, one of them is being marketed as a 10th anniversary edition, and it's actually a very different text. Um, and this is 2010 reflecting on um, Hurricane Katrina. So um, astounding, you can actually see if I hold the books this way, you can see that they are of different lengths. I think you can see, can you see Amy? Okay, yeah, you can see that they're not the same length at all. So uh, it was surprising to me to be in the middle of class. Why can't you find that on this page? Um, so that was striking. Again, speaking to the very kinds of issues that, um, that uh, regenerations indirectly uh, engages or engages um, behind the scenes, if you will, whereas their foreground it matters in Amy's important piece. Um, I, uh, so I felt provoked and wanted to mention that and raise the question of, are we miseducating if we have, if we decide to, that a bad book is um, not as good as any book? Um, or I don't think I said that right. When, right. Again, the question is, is no book better than a bad book or no text better than a bad text? Um, and of course I fall on the side of, um, absolutely, we need some text rather than, even if it's bad. 
So because I am interested most in introducing people to the greater variety of African-American writers that are out there. Um, uh, let me move to, uh, um, to closing up. I'm feeling beginning to feel self-conscious. So I wanted to say that I agree with uh, Amy about a, an important point in her chapter, which is that at the time that women and people of color began to enter textual studies and the kind of work that John and I are doing, um, then the, suddenly editing is perceived, and I've heard this in many committee meetings um, with, to you know, my great astonishment and uh, upset, that editing is now perceived at, as at best a rote mechanical process. I've heard that primarily, I should say exclusively by persons I consider white gatekeepers of the academy. In my own department, we've had, you know, a tense debate on the, um, as I have been engaged in, in, in tense and intense debates about um, uh, what promotion guidelines should stand for digital text. And I was, you um, the, uh, on the executive committee of the Council of Editors of Learned Journals um, easily five, 10 years ago. And we were you know, confronting the matter of open access and also e-documents. And you know, we wrote papers in defense of that and published those on the CELJ website years ago. How is this nonsense about the gold standard of the book um, still alive? I don't understand that. Um, what I found most provocative in Earhart's paper, uh, though in her chapter, was her emphasis on structural racism. She suggests that um, she quotes John Young and other scholars who um, are, uh, are very concerned that white scholars who are white academics, not scholars, white academics who have little knowledge of black texts, these are Earhart's words, that they are the persons most involved in um, textual studies and uh, in textual studies. And so therefore uh, black studies is underrepresented. She gives, I'm gonna repeat some of the stats from her um, chapter, which, and she's mentioned them earlier today, that 14 out of 261 of the Nor Norton critical editions um, as of 2017, only 14 of them gave attention to um, authors of the uh, who represent the African diaspora. The Library of, uh, of America editions, she tells us, 17 out of 301 were people of African descent. And that's not to say U.S. African-Americans or U.S. born Blacks, that was people of African descent, 14 out of 261 and 17 out of 300, I'm sorry, 14 out of 261, 17 out of 301. So ultimately, um, uh, near the conclusion of her chapter, Earhart says that the lack of, I'm quoting here, the lack of critically edited, carefully edited materials, especially those within a catalog for teaching, such as the Norton Critical Edition series, suggests that the texts are not important, moving against the recovery work we have been doing for years, end quote. Well, for me, I want to go one step further and say, I don't read it so much as that the texts are not as important as that Black people are not important, that we are unimaginative, that we are unintelligible, uh, unintelligent, that we are uneducable, that we are too different from white people to be educated and allowed to excel on our own terms. And um, so I want to end there. If you take nothing from my talk, please take away this, that when we think about the future of textual studies, the future of any US institutions will look just like the present until we commit to educating more black and indigenous people of color scholars. And moreover, allowing them to set the agendas and standards of creative intelligence on their own terms. I'm sorry, creative excellence on their own terms. Thanks so much. Thank you, Joycelyn. So I really appreciated all your comments and I'm sure we'll have, this will be great. I can already see where the discussion is going. I wanna introduce our final speaker in this really interesting conversation we're having. Um, AAS member, Kirsten silver Gruss is professor of literature at the University of California, Santa Cruz, where she teaches a broad chronolo chronological range of American and US Latinx literatures. 
She is the author of Ambassadors of Culture, The Trans-American Origins of Latino Writing, Princeton UP 2002, a study focused on the 19th century and of over two dozen published essays on Spanish language print culture in what is now the United States. Her new book, Cotton Mather's Spanish Lessons, Language, Race, and American Memory, examines multilingualism in early 18th century New England through a reading of Mather's La Fe del Cristiano. Nourished by research at the AAS, the book will be published in spring 2022 by Harvard UP. The recipient of an NEH faculty research fellowship and a Frederick Burkhart fellowship from the ACLS, she serves on the editorial boards of Early American Literature and J19, the MLA Forum on Early American Literature and the Board of Supervisors of the English Institute. Thank you so much. And I will now turn the floor over to Dr. Gross. Thank you, Amy. Let me get my, um, my slides up here. Um, there we go. Um, I was prompted to respond to the statement, uh, Amy, that you read uh, by the MLA Committee on Scholarly Editions. Uh, we seek to review editions that will help rectify the historical underrepresentation of racial, ethnic, gender, and linguistic diversity in the list of publications that receive the seal of the MLA Committee on Scholarly Editions. And so what I work on is the way that linguistic performance be can be a racializing feature uh, for Latina OX populations. And um, as you'll see on the map, um, when I'm thinking about the future of scholarly editions, I'm thinking about the relationship between classroom editions and scholarly editions in that the former are um, produced from, ideally produced from the latter, um, but also thinking about what directions will the 21st century professoriate, assuming that there still is such a thing as the university at the end of this century, what directions will they want to take American, that is US literature, um, and must those works be originally written in English? And of course, the concept of a scholarly edition is that it will be um, aimed at readers of the language in which the text was originally produced because of the link between originalism and, um, and the idea of a reliable text, right? So um, I was intrigued that the institutional bodies that, um, that um, legitimate these scholarly editions, that is the MLA CSC, are different from the bodies that uh, look at and award prizes to translation. So the MLA also has this text and translation series, which is really all about uh, world literature in translation. There's not a single um, US based text in a language other than English produced by that. Uh, by that group. So is a translated edition a scholarly edition? It seems like there's a there's a kind of built-in contradiction there. And um, given that the um, there's not a complete overlap, of course, between the Latino X population of school children and the population of school children who speak a language other than English. But there's, uh, it's a strong Venn diagram, right? Spanish is the dominant uh, language among those non-English texts that are represented. And so with that in mind, um, there were some powerful late 20th century scholarly projects, um, the Lowness Institute at Harvard that produced only two in its projected long series of 19th and early 20th century um, editions and translations, so reliable scholarly editions that were also um, uh, uh, translations aimed at the classroom. And uh, that project folded the Recovering the US Hispanic Literary Heritage Project, which came into being after the Columbus Quincentenary and has produced, reprinted, as they say, more than 40 historical books, really tremendous um, initiative that I'm also involved with. Um, and among those 40, some are um, in Spanish and some have um, uh, bilingual editions, but the recovery project in recent years has pivoted to um, some really important uh, digital edition work. Um, and they no longer have the funding to produce textbooks, to produce either classroom editions, um, 
unless they receive a complete subvention from the editor's institution, which is really a, a kind of daunting um, gateway. So what we've seen actually is that as the number of, um, of young um, students who speak a language other than English has climbed, the available pathways for published work in languages other than English have actually shrunk, uh, unless one goes to a digital edition, uh, which is a, a separate question. And the um, so there's a kind of gap for US-based non-English language publications. They don't fall into the, um, the CSC's list. There's not a single one of those recovery works, the ones that have been published, um, that have received the CSC seal. I'm not sure any of those editors actually sought them either because um, it's a fairly high bar um, to pass and because of the translation problem, right? What's the standards for a translation are different from um, those for a scholarly edition. And, um, and so into this gap where neither the MLA text and translation series nor the, um, the, um, the CSC bar have um, encouraged us to think about what it would mean to produce scholarly editions of US American literature that are not in English. So for an example, um, this is the text that I've been working on for over 10 years now. Um, it was originally why am I not advancing? There we go. Originally uh, published in uh, a longstanding 19th century Spanish language publication in New Orleans, La Patria. And it turns out that one of the editors who penned this serialized novel was actually born in Florida after it was taken over by the US. So arguably it is the first Latino novel. Um, and it appears as serialized uh, novels often do with all sorts of wonderful um, advertisements, um, ship um, uh, notices of ship arrival and so forth, uh, as well as news obviously that appear in the periodical and that um, become a kind of uh, important corollary texts for, um, for that novel. It's a, uh, it's, it's a work that kind of falls into the cracks between the sentimental and the sensational novel. Um, I think a good analog is Julia C. Collins's The Curse of Caste or The Slave Bride, published in the Christian Recorder in 1865. And there was a 2006 edition of that serialized novel um, that used uh, print, uh, uh, microform copies of the Christian Recorder as their proof text, and the editors also composed two alternate endings, which I'm sure the CSC would not approve of. Um, but so uh, the question arises, do you need a scholarly edition of a serialized novel if there was no um, manuscript, and if, as in this case, there are no um, extant copies of the um, uh, of the book form um, that was prepared by um, the, um, the same press after the serialization was complete. And I haven't located any extant copies of that completed codex form. And um, in fact, there's only one, um, one known paper copy of the, um, of th that contains all of the installments of the novel itself. Um, and that's at the Historic New Orleans Collection, although AAS does it have a couple of the, um, of the issues with the serialization. So to prepare a translation, um, I um, had the, um, the innovative opportunity to work with uh, Prof Professor Jose Aranda's uh, class at Rice University. And um, Jose, um, like me, is concerned with uh, uh, the kind of, um, the terrible loss of the educational and social capital that happens when you do not um, have an institutional way to support the growth of the language literacies that children in those non-US, uh, sorry, non-English um, dominant homes already have from, um, from their home languages, when you don't support that to um, help them produce academic literacies. So he actually runs a Chicano studies class 
uh, which is a heritage, uh, a class for heritage language speakers. Um, often the students uh, have um, some, you know, missing points on grammar or orthography, et cetera. Um, but the point of heritage language instruction is, which happens in, of course, in languages other than Spanish as well, is to uh, build on literacies that already exist and to, um, to give that kind of academic validation. It's super important. Um, so he runs this workshop and he has, um, his students have worked with uh, this novel and with another serialized production uh, from a San Antonio newspaper, actually, in the 1920s and 30s, and he's preparing an, uh, an edition of that. Um, but just quickly, uh, we talk about um, fluid text, and I see that John Bryant's in the um, in the audience there. Uh, and here the issue isn't uh, isn't multiple versions. Um, between um, manuscript and um, and editions published in different places, like the uh, um, the, the British and U.S. publications of Moby Dick, um, but with the idea of diachronic fluidity. So fluidity across time. This is an instance from um, the opening scene where the, the dissatisfied young husband is complaining about how his wife dresses sloppily to come down to breakfast. It's kind of hilarious. But um, what we worked with um, with the students is in um, obviously identifying terms that have changed in meaning in Spanish over time. So this is an introduction to 19th century Spanish. The orthography is different, et cetera. Um, but also thinking about that problem of diachronic translation translation and do you translate into a more contemporary language? So um, our uh, Chicano students were all uh, intimately familiar with this, um, with this turn here, con los zapatos en chancletas. So he's complaining that instead of wearing real shoes, she's wearing uh, you know, slippers or flip-flops in this case. And there's a whole history that the students brought in uh, with um, the memes around um, uh, the uh, the Mexican mom and the uh, the chancleta. So um, just in closing, um, I wanted to recall that uh, on the AAS page is the uh, archived is the syllabus for um, a really instructive. Um, uh, a program in the history of the book and American culture uh, seminar, um, and I hope this will resume at AAS now that um, that uh, the COVID landscape is changing. Um, you can hyperlink to the syllabus um, from this page, but the graduate students and the younger scholars are doing such great work, uh, especially on indigenous languages and bringing forth some of these materials that have fallen through the cracks that have been neglected by a monolingual view of what American literature is. So thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I'm gonna turn this over to Ashley, but I first wanna thank each of the panelists. That was really wonderful and thought provoking and you've really launched us for a wonderful discussion. Um, thank, thank you all for coming. Um, I think we're gonna try to squeeze a question or two here at the end, but um, thank everyone. I want to thank everyone for coming and remind you that um, we're gonna have more panels today, one more panel today and more tomorrow. Um, and we hope to see you there as well. But at this point, I'm gonna turn um, the questions over to Ashley. Yes, thank you everyone. Um, we just have one question in the, in the Q&A and I'd just like to read it in case um, we want to address it and then we'll wrap up. Um, so Professor Jones, and this is for um, Doug, but we can also uh, think about Cooper in relation to some of this. Um, this figure is not one I've incorporated into my classes yet, and um, now I certainly will. One I've recently begun having my students read is Anna J. Cooper's Voice from the South. Um, and I, I don't know that this question um, can really be answered, so I think maybe we'll leave it um, for uh, another time, and, and maybe um, we can uh, sort of be in touch with Doug by email, but did Stuart and Cooper correspond? Um, I ask since Cooper does seem to me uh, more of a political philosopher than a literary figure. Um, we also have a question from John Bryant, and I think this is the one that maybe we can um, get to. Uh, uh, Joycelyn, I like your discussion of the bad text better than no text dilemma. To acknowledge bad text is to open the door for scholarly editing. How do we organize such a project in light of the dominant academic view that editing is not critically important, just mechanical work? And Joycelyn, I don't know if you'd like to, to address that at all. Um, if you would like, uh, if not, maybe we can, again, we have three other panels that we can, um, we can sort of have these discussions at. 
Um, well, I'll defer to you, Ashley. Do you think we have time for a little yeah, let's, engagement? Yeah, if you'd, if you'd like to, okay. let's plan to stick around um, another maybe two or three minutes if you'd okay. like to. Okay. Okay. Um, actually, I want to defer to, um, to Amy. Um, did you want to respond to the question, Amy, since this is coming out of um, your chapter? Yeah, this is a question I've been wrestling with for a long time, and um, I changed my mind a lot about this. But, um, you know, I agree. Look, any text at this point for some of these works, we need it just to have to start the conversation. Um, so I guess I wouldn't say it was a bad text necessarily, um, which is probably something some scholarly editors would say. But, you know, maybe a text that's not as accurate as others, but we can start there. Um, I think I think the issue now for me is how do we show that this work is central um, to the kinds of critical discussions we're having and that this kind of work, which you're right, gets gets thought of as me me mechanistic and tenure and promotion committees poo poo this work, especially if you're doing it with undergraduates or graduate students, as I've done. Um, that's a huge problem and it, it really needs to start shifting. And I'm, I don't have a good answer to it. It's been something I've been wrestling with for a long time. Um, so I guess I'll throw it back out there, Joycelyn. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. It is a, it is an acute dilemma. Um, I, uh, I think that what we have to do, the project isn't necessarily a, um, well, it's a scholarly one, but I think it more has to do with working with our tenure and promotion uh, committees. I think that it's a matter of educating um, our institutions about the work we do. I mentioned the CELJ website, and I haven't looked there in a while to see um, what kinds of documents they have um, produced, uh, the institution that CELJ has produced for um faculty who uh, and scholars who write primarily, maybe even exclusively for um, the internet. Um, they publish you know, open re access and they publish in e-journals and so on. They um, have um, uh, DH um, digital humanities projects that are you know, extremely time consuming and erudite. And uh, I think that the work is for us as faculty activists to advocate for the scholarship and the labor that goes into um, those, um, those kinds of productions. It's on us and the work is in um, the social worlds we inhabit, to quote Douglas again, and um, to teach our faculty about what is required. I think it's coming from a very old um, and outdated, obsolete um, standard for what is good. Um, so I, I guess I'll stop there. So I would love to know what John thinks about our answers if we have another minute or two. And you're willing to, John. John, if you'd like to jump in, please do. And... I'm not sure John is okay. able to speak. So maybe we'll okay. hear from him tomorrow. Okay. Okay. Thank you, Joycelyn. Uh, of course. Well, I would just like to say an enormous thank you to Amy, Joycelyn, Kirsten, and Douglas for this great panel. I think you've highlighted a lot of the issues that we will be returning to over the next panel and the day to come, particularly in, involved with the labor that goes into creating editions. This is labor that is often unseen by people who use the editions, or at least unacknowledged by people who use, use the editions. I think, Joycelyn, you've raised this question about how we acknowledge it in the professions, uh, the profession of literary studies, as well as the profession of history. And I think this is, this is a crucial question. Um, and we at AAS have been and are delighted to be involved with this work. And I think one of the things we need to think about as institutions like AAS is how our own involvement with editions goes beyond the canonical and goes to the kinds of editions that really expand our notions of what American literatures have been over time. That's the work that we have to do going forward. So I wanna thank each of you for your participation in this panel. I wanna thank all the people who are watching as well and for the questions. Uh, our next panel begins at two o'clock. So it's a chance to stretch Get, get a glass of water or whatever and come right back at two o'clock and we will pick up again. Thanks ever so much.